Well, good morning, good morning. I already made somebody mad. Uh, sorry. Um, so grateful that you're here this morning. Um, preaching two times in a row is, is going to be a little different, um, but uh, I think I'm going to enjoy it. I hope you do too. Um, that's my prayer today is that you hear it. Uh, but before I get started, um, the staff wanted me to ask a question. Um, and the question basically is, um, we want to provide more time for life group on Sunday mornings. Um, we are sandwiching it between the two services currently. Um, today, we didn't have it. So for those of you who showed up, my apologies. Um, we, uh, we sh- I guess we didn't get the word out well enough. Um, but um, we are talking about taking the first service and making it earlier. Um, which all of you chose the second service, so probably uh, making it earlier wouldn't affect you. Um, But uh, taking it to 8 o'clock or taking the second service to 11. Um, just to give us 30 more minutes in life group so that, uh, because a lot of the time you guys are watching videos or, and, and that kind of thing. And so um, you watch the video um, and then you got like three seconds to talk about it and then it's time for church to start again. And so um, we believe that life group is where community, where you do life on life together. And so we want to provide more time for you during that time. So um, how many of you would, if we backed the 8.30 service up to 8, how many of you would show up for that one? All right, cool. Um, If we move this one to 11, how many of you would still come to the 11 o'clock? See, you guys are my people. Um, I am not a morning person. Um, I woke up extremely early to preach that first service just so that I would be awake enough, and then I had, I probably had three Dr. Peppers today. Um, But anyway, um, so... Um, All right, so, and then how many of you would rather move the first service and leave the second one alone? Ooh, hands shot up quick. All right, all right, all right. Um, So I'll take that staff meeting tomorrow, and we'll talk about it. Those changes won't come until January, though, Um, and so uh, just be uh, listening and checking out social and uh, come to church, and we'll talk about it. Um, So um, with that said, I want to get started this morning, and I started with a quote. Um, I've got a quote to start with, and uh, a couple of people in the first service came and told me um, who they think said it, Um, and so I will give credit to that guy. Um, He said something similar, but I don't know where I heard it, and I tried to look it up on the computer. I tried to Google it. I tried to try to figure it all out, and I just, I couldn't find it, Um, but the quote is this. What is assumed in one generation is often forgotten in the next. And maybe you've heard something similar to that. Um, but what, I, what, let me repeat it. It's, yeah. What is assumed in one generation is often forgotten in the next. And here's the thing. I, I'm not going to preach that because that's not Bible. Um, but I do believe it's true. And I do believe all truth is God's truth. If something is true, then it's Okay. All right, so what is assumed in one generation is often forgotten in the next. Now, while that's probably not in the Bible, I believe that the principle behind that is in the Bible. And we see that all throughout the Old Testament where people were following close to God, and then all of a sudden they started turning their backs, and then they started worshiping idols and and, and that kind of stuff. So let me take you back to Joshua. Um, Joshua, uh, for mo- many of you, um, hopefully you know who Joshua was, but he was the leader of Israel after Moses. Moses uh, led the people out of Egypt. Um, if you've watched um, Let My People Go, like Moses, you know. Uh, oh, man, my mind went blank. What's that Disney movie? Prince of Egypt, right? So, sorry, thank you. Um, you know, and so maybe you've seen that movie. Maybe you've read the Bible. Um, and so you know that Moses went into Egypt and said, hey, let my people go. And he, um, after the ten plagues and all of that, you know, some of you have heard those stories, um, you, you know, and he marched them out. And they wandered in the wilderness for a long time because they sent 12 spies into the promised land to spy out the land. And Joshua and Caleb were the only two that came back and said, hey, it's awesome. Let's do this. The other 10 guys were like, ah, there's giants. I don't know if we can. And they began questioning and doubting God. And because of that, Israelites did not take the promised land as God told them to. And so they ended up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years while that generation passed on. And Joshua became the leader after that and led the people into Israel, or yeah, into the promised land. All right. 
And so um, through that, um, they got into the promised land and they started enjoying the place and all of that stuff. Um, and Joshua was a great leader, but there were a couple of things that he failed on, right? And as a result, some of the gods that were in the lands, they started thinking that they should worship those gods or worship the gods back from Egypt. And they started turning their backs on the Lord God, the only God, right? And so in Joshua 24, verse 15, this is toward the end of Joseph's life. And many of you have heard this. Um, this it was probably hanging, it might be hanging up in your house. It was probably hanging up in your grandmother's house. Um, but it says this, Joshua 24, 15. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers that your God, uh, the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Right? He was coming to the Israelites and saying, hey, look, choose today. You've got to make a decision. If you're going to follow God, follow him. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And I pray that you've made that declaration over your house, that you are going to serve the Lord. And he reminded them of everything God had brought the Israelites through to bring them to the place that they were. And the people said, yes, we will serve the Lord. And they decided to do so. And in Judges, or verse 31, Michael, sorry. Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua and had known all the work that the Lord did for Israel. So his speech must have been an awesome one. Right? That they served the days, they served the Lord all the days of Joshua and even the elders who outlived Joshua during that time. And we flip to Judges, the next book, and we see in verse 7, pretty much the same exact verse. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done. And so we see that this generation followed God. Yeah, they made mistakes. But ultimately, they followed God. But here's a problem. Three verses later, it said, And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. Point number one today is the assumption. The assumption. Something happened between those two generations for Joshua and his generation to follow God with everything they had and for the next generation to walk away, to do what they wanted to, that didn't know the Lord or do or the work that he had done. And I think there's some assumptions that were made. And I think we're guilty of the same thing. A lot of times we will assume that, well, we bring our kids to church and they'll get it. We'll just drop them off on a Wednesday night and let the uh, preschool children and youth guy deal with that. But here's the problem with that. There are 168 hours in the week. We get them, the church gets them for one, maybe two if you bring them to church and life group. There isn't enough time. But we think that, well, we'll get them to church um, and, and, and we'll let them handle them or we'll let the church disciple them or we'll let, you know, and it doesn't work that way. Specifically because the Bible teaches the exact opposite of that. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Psalm chapter 78 this morning. Psalm chapter 78 this morning. So as you're flipping there, here's, here's what I want you to take away more than, well, No as equal to. Let's just leave it there. It's never too late. God is a God of second chances, and he's full of grace. Okay? So as I'm teaching, as I'm, as I'm, as I'm preaching this morning, I want you to remember those things. It's never too late. God loves us, and he's full of grace. He gives us second chances over and over and over and over and over, 15th chances sometimes. Let's go, verse 1, chapter, Psalms chapter 78. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old. 
things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell them to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children, that the next generation might know them. The children yet unborn and arise and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. And that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. Here's the thing, going back to verses one through four, point number two today is the command. The command. If you take a look at verse, uh, well, two, it says, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old. Um, Holman Christian says it this way, I will declare wise sayings. I will speak mysteries from the past. And that whole language right there is just obscure stuff. I asked the first, uh, first service this morning, um, how many of you know what lefty, loosey, righty, tidy is? All right, a little, a little more than half, maybe. Um, it's one of those things, I, I, you know, I didn't know that was an actual saying. I, you know, I just thought that was something obscure my dad taught me. Um, but, you know, my dad was a mechanic kind of before going into the ministry. And, you know, I am grateful every day for the things that my dad taught me as I grew up. Um, I could change brakes on a car. Um, I could change oil. And, of course, that's a fun story. Um, about the fourth time I changed my oil, um, long story short, I had 15 quarts of oil in my car. Um, it's only supposed to have four. Um, so good, good story. I'll, I'll save it for another day. But um, you know, right? And so here's, here's verse two. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings. I will I'll speak these mysteries, right? I will speak um, these wise sayings. And this is how wisdom is passed. Is wisdom is passed when we open our mouths and we teach and we talk and we share that with others. I love sitting down with my grandparents and listening to the stories that they would tell of how they grew up and what they had to deal with and, you know, walking to school in the snow uphill, both what, you know, those kind of things. Like, you know what I'm saying, right? Verse 3, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. This is how wisdom is received. We receive wisdom by people pouring into us, teaching us, showing us how things are, right? The whole lefty, loosey, righty, tighty thing. You use that probably more than you ever thought you would. Like, it's crazy. Um, I, you know, it, it, it is. All right. um, so, let me rewind for a minute and tell you a story. Um, my call to ministry started in the fifth grade. Now, I couldn't have told you that when I was in the fifth grade. But as I'm almost 40 in a couple of months, looking back, um, I can see that it started in the fifth grade. And the way that God has orchestrated and moved and, and, and changed things in my life in order for that to happen. I was riding the bus um, in elementary school, fifth grade. Um, beginning of the year, um, fifth grade then um, at that school, they started band. And I wanted to be in the band so much. But I knew my parents couldn't afford it. There's no possible way. And so I didn't even ask them. And I rode a bus with a guy named Douglas, um, Douglas Hinton. Um, and uh, he and I were uh, good friends that rode the bus together. Um, I had big glasses, and he had big glasses. Um, this picture, I think, um, is about uh, maybe a year older, so this may be sixth grade. But check those glasses. This is me, by the way, uh, the dude on the far left. Um, we uh, are all redheaded. We all have blue eyes. Um, we all like each other for the most part. And so walking through the mall together, holding hands, like people stare and give you weird looks. Um, but check those glasses out. Douglas had big glasses like I did, right? But Douglas, every day after school would, or on the way home, would talk about how awesome band was and how I should join. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I, I can't do that. I can't. I know my parents don't have the money. And over and over and over, he would talk to me about band. And I'm like, oh, I want to join so bad. Well, one day, Douglas came and said, hey, look, I talked to the band director. He's got an instrument that you could play. I'm like, are you serious? He's like, yeah. He's got an instrument. He'll, he'll let you play it. He's like, you just got to get your parents to go talk to him. 
I'm like, man, okay, okay. So I got home. I started laying it on, right? You know, as a fifth grader, you, you got kids. Y'all know, like, you, we just pour it on, pour it on, pour it on, ask it, right? And they're like, we can't, we can't afford that. There's no possible way. I'm like, the band director said he's got an instrument. I had no idea. It could have been the bassoon. I, I didn't know at the time. Like, I didn't know what it was, but the band director had an instrument, and I could play. And so finally, I convinced them to go talk to the band director, Mr. Fortenberry. And so they showed up. They talked. Mr. Fortenberry went to a back instrument room closet thing and pulled out a trumpet. from. It looked like from the 1930s. It was dinged up and beat up, and the, the valves wouldn't move and that kind of stuff. But I got to join the band three, four months after it started in the fifth grade with an old beat-up trumpet because Douglas and Mr. Fortenberry m- made it happen. Now, do you hear God moving in that story? Well, probably not without the rest of it, right? That's just everyday stuff. But here's the thing. When you look back over your lives and see how God orchestrated a move in different ways, you see God used Douglas and Mr. Fortenberry to develop a love for music in my heart. And God used that love of music to call me into the ministry and then tricked me because I'm not doing music anymore, right? I'm doing student ministry, which I love, by the way. But it's a whole other story. I can tell you how God tricked me another day. But see, God uses the stories in our hearts and in our, our lives to teach the coming generation, to tell them about what God is doing in our lives and how God is moving. Where are the stories? What are the stories in your life that you have seen God move and orchestrate different things? Maybe that's what brought you to Petal, Mississippi. Maybe that's what's got you sitting in the chair you are sitting in today. But my question is, do your kids know that story? Have you ever shared those things? Because when the Bible talks about sharing and talking about all of those things, it typically talks about Israel coming out of Egypt, right? And even Joshua in his story, as he's saying, hey, choose today, this day, he goes back to Egypt. And starts talking to them about all the good things God had done to the people of Israel. The question is, God's doing those same things for you. Do your kids know it? Have they seen God move in your life? A couple of weeks ago, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching in youth, and, and, and I, I quote, experiencing God. How many of you have done experiencing God? Henry Blackaby at some point during four, five, six. Okay. Um, I've never done it, by the way. Um, but there's a, there's a principle that, that he teaches in that book that says, find where God is working and join him there. And so I asked the kids, I said, where is God working in your lives? I got blank stares. Got blank stares. Probably one of the hardest questions that they had ever been asked. What do you mean God's working? God's working in my life? continually, every day. We just have to to, to take a look and see where those are. See the things that God is doing. See and join him there. Work with him in those different things. Verse 4 says we can't hide them. We will not hide them from our children. We've got to tell the stories. We can talk about the Bible all day long. And it's great and it's good and it's true. But when we have a personal testimony of how God has orchestrated the events in our lives to bring us to where we are, that speaks volumes, especially to our kids. So tell your story. Point number three is the responsibility. The responsibility. This is not an option. Verse five and six it says, he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach their children. It's this idea of that spiritual relay race, right? We're in the race, and our kids are coming up behind us, and we want them to join the race with us. And so we're either passing the baton or we're dragging them along with us, but we're doing that. Are you doing that? Let me ask. Because over and over in Scripture, he says that, in verse 6, that the next generation might know them might know your stories. 
might know our stories. Um, I told you a while ago, my dad's a pastor, um, and like I've got a billion and a half stories of how God moved in our lives. God called my dad to, to move to Alaska and the pastor a church up there, um, and that was in the reverse order. We moved to Alaska, and then God called him to, to preach at a church. Um, he had no job to go to. He just knew God was leading him there to go. Now, that's crazy, all right? Um, but when God tells you to do something, you need to do it. Another story for another day. Took a church, okay? You saw there's six of us in the photo, right? Took a church that paid my dad $150 a week, and we lived 90 miles from the grocery store. And our heater bill was $700 a month. So just do the math on that, 150 a week, that's $600 a month, right? Heater bill $700 a month, and I never missed a meal. You can kind of tell it. I never missed a meal. I actually was on the basketball team, and because we lived so far away from other people, um, we would, when we would go on basketball trips or to go play, it was a, like a tournament tour kind of thing. We would go to this town and play. We'd go to this town and play. We'd go to this town and play. And the nearest town was 60 miles away. Um, they didn't have a grocery store. Um, but we would go and go and go and go. And so the history teacher and his wife, um, history, te- history teacher was the, the guy's basketball coach. The, his wife was the English teacher. Um, the girl's basketball coach was the math teacher. And so we had the whole school with us. All right. And so we would go on these trips and I never missed a meal. Now, I had like $2 for breakfast, $3 for lunch, right? But back then, Taco Bell, 99-cent burrito, and there's no taxes in Alaska. Man, two burritos and a drink, two ninety-seven, dollars right? I could do it. But God orchestrates these things in our lives so that we get excited to tell our kids about them. Now, I want you to hear it. I'm probably not doing as good of a job as I should be, right? And I'm the pastor. But I want to challenge you. Because as it says, uh, as one commentator said, um, it is scripture leaves no room for apparent neutrality. You can't be neutral. And I think a lot of us live our lives in neutral. We go with the flow. There's no intentionality in much of our lives. We get up, we go to work, we do what we have to do, we come home. We turn on the TV, we turn on our devices. Coach Kelly was in the first service, I don't see him now. Um, But Shane challenged the baseball team nearly every week I was there. All right, how many have eaten dinner with your family at least one time this week? Two times this week, three times this week. And he is grilling the baseball team and challenging the students to tell their parents, hey, let's sit down and enjoy a meal together. Because it's around those meal times that we get to share stories and talk and, and, and live li- and do life together. And if you add some intentionality to that, it becomes a whole lot easier to share your story, to share your testimony, to share what God is doing in your lives. Deuteronomy chapter 6, 4 through 12 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit down in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes and you shall write them on the doorpost of, the, of your house and on your gates. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant, and when you eat and are full, then take care, lest you forget the Lord, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery." This warning, point number four, this warning, take care lest you forget the Lord. I think this one's huge. In a lot of ways, I'm glad that I grew up poor. 
because when, you're, when you don't have anything, like your dependence is on God. Right now, I've got a pantry full of food at my house. I can go and pig out all day, probably a couple of days, three days, four days, and it wouldn't phase me at all. I've got money in a savings account, which before Dave Ramsey probably would have never happened, right? Um, you know, but those, those are like when we get comfortable, when we have what we need, we're a little less dependent on God. And Moses, this was, he was telling them, telling them the story and, and, and warning them, hey, look, you're fixing to go into the promised land and you're fixing to get all of this stuff that you didn't work for, that you didn't get, and you have to take care because it's going to be very easy to forget the Lord because you're not depending on him every day. All throughout the story, and even in chapter 78, if you continue reading, um, the writer in, in Psalm is reminding the people of how God fed them with manna every day. He fed them, he, he gave them water from a rock. He provided every day. I will never forget, I think my prayer life was better in college than it had ever been, and actually into my couple of first years of marriage, because I had a 1992 GM Sonoma pickup truck, if you call it that, it was this big. Um, but it uh, would crank most days after some uh, prayer, <laughs> really. That's all it really was, is prayer. Um, and uh, and, and it, it would maybe finally crank, but it would only do 35 miles an hour. Um, and so I was the guy that you were honking at driving down Hardy Street doing 35 miles an hour because I couldn't go any faster. And I was praying that I wouldn't stall because it was a standard in the middle of an intersection, you know, west over 98, those kind of places. And, you know, those kind of things. And so, like, my prayer life was really, really good then. And when you can only do 35 miles an hour, you're spending a lot of time in a vehicle. So you got a lot more time to pray <laughs> and, to, and to, you know. But those, those are the things, like, you know, I've got a vehicle now that I would not, I wouldn't hesitate to drive from here to Alaska in. i just take off and go. Um, if you stop and do the tourist things, it takes you about 12 days, by the way. Uh, my dad did it in seven by himself, and uh, I've heard of people doing it in about three and a half to four days, but that's never turning the car off. Um, one sleeps, the other drives, and it's ridiculous, right? But we forget a lot of times that God is our sustainer and provider because we didn't, typically don't want for much. There's not a whole lot of things that, that, that are, are dependent or we feel like are dependent on God stepping in, providing in miraculous ways. Pay attention to the warning. Point five is the reason. Set your hope in God. Or more so, share the story so that your children will set their hope in God. Verse 7 says, so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Right? We want our kids, we want everyone to set their hope in God. Not forgetting the works that God has done. Like I said a while ago, it's very easy for us to say, okay, this is what God did. He brought his people out of Egypt. And your kids look at you and are like, what does that mean for me? It doesn't matter. That's why sharing your story is so important. But keep his commandments. You know, I think, I think we, we often miss out on an element of discipleship, and that's the obedience part. I think we can teach people um, a whole lot of information, but anytime you start to hold people accountable for that information, don't judge me. You can't judge me, right? But that's what discipleship leads to. Discipleship leads to obedience. We need to stop teaching our kids how to be good people. We need to teach our kids how to depend on Christ and him in our lives by sharing the story that we have. Our mission here at the church is engaging people with the hope of the gospel to see lives transformed. Engage people with the hope of the gospel to see lives transformed. Our mission for our student ministry here, engage students with the hope of the gospel to see lives transformed. I want you to have the same mission, 
to engage your kids with the hope of the gospel, to see lives transformed, and, and engage your neighbors, engage your friends, engage your coworkers with the hope of the gospel to see lives transformed. Because this is what it's all about. This, taking the gospel to the world. So here's the question. Point number six. Do you have a story? Do you have a story? Can you look back over your life and see where God has been working and moving in your life? Because I guarantee at fifth grade, I had no idea God started that. And it really wasn't until sophomore year in college where I'm like, okay, God, maybe. I'll, I'll surrender to the ministry, maybe. And over the next couple of years, he worked in me and on me. And as I said, I was, I was tricked into ministry, right? So I thought music it was it. So I started leading worship, doing that kind of thing. Um, and then God called me to a church as a youth pastor. And I was like, ooh, no, mm-mm. I was real comfortable with the guitar in front of my hands, in front of me, to detect me from you guys, right? I've told you I'm an introvert, and so most of the time I'm in the background, I'm behind the scenes. Some of you haven't seen me since March because I've been in the, the live stream room um, overseeing and, and fixing mistakes and putting out fires and, and doing all those things. But that's because that stuff gets me excited. I never, ever would I ever have thought preaching God's word would make me excited. Seeing your kids each week gets me excited. So my question is, do you have a story? Can you see the way that God's been orchestrating and moving in your life? Or do, do, you, even, do you have a story? Have you placed your faith and trust in Christ? Have you started a relationship with him so that he can orchestrate and he can move things around in your life? Because until you accept the gospel, until you place your faith and trust in him, that he lived a perfect life, he died the death that you and I deserved, he was buried for three days and then rose from the grave, victorious over hell, death, and sin. Until you place your faith and trust in him, your story really hasn't started. And actually, the Bible says that you're dead in your trespasses. And that's not pleasant to hear. But that's really, really where you are. Because your story can't start apart from life. And Jesus Christ is life. So if you've never made that decision to follow him, do that today. Some of you have done that, have never been baptized. Love to talk to you about that, right? Make that public. Show everybody. But here's the bottom line of all today. Don't assume they know. That could be your kids. That could be your neighbors. That could be your coworkers. Don't assume they know. Make the gospel and the story God is doing in your life as clear as possible to your family and friends. Make it as clear as you can. Tell them the stories. Tell them the stories of how God has brought you from this to this, from death to life, from sin to him. Share the stories. Take some time and evaluate. Go home today. Eat lunch together as a family. Talk about a story that's popped into your mind since I've been preaching. Well, God, yeah, you did that, didn't you? Yeah. And if nothing else, tell them where you were when you got saved. Let them know that Christ has made a difference in your life. There's a verse, if you want to write it down, I don't have it on the screen, but Psalm 71, 17 and 18 says this, O God, from my youth you have taught me, and I still proclaim your wondrous deeds. So even to old age and gray hairs, O oh God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to another generation, your power to all those who come. That's my prayer. 
I get questioned all the time, well, when are you going to become a real pastor? Right? I'm just a student pastor. I don't, I don't do much. Um, my kids say I only work two days or one day a week, you know, that kind of stuff. When are you going to be a real pastor? I preached at my dad's church, and I had a little old lady come up to me and say, uh, hey, you, you could be a real pastor one day. I'm like, well, thanks. <laughs> I thought I was, but, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, walked up to somebody else, and it was, it was a joke. I thought they would understand. I said that. Um, and this lady said, from your mouth to God's ears. I'm like, no, I am a real pastor, I promise. I, I <laughs> but look, I turned 40 in, in March. And people do. They ask me all the time, how, how much longer can you do student ministry? And I'm like, as long as God will let me. So even to old age and gray hairs, don't forsake me, God. I want to teach and preach the gospel to the next generation. That's my heart. That's my passion. And here's the thing. I can't do it by myself. Miss Denise can't do it by herself. Miss Karen can't do it by their, herself. We need you. We get one hour a week, maybe two, if we're lucky, with the students that come into the building. With your kids. We need you. Karen and Denise and me, we're always looking for volunteers. Come, share your story to the next generation. Share your story with your next generation, your kids, your family, your friends. It doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are. That is what we're called to do. Will you join me in that? Let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you. God, for loving us. God, for providing a way of escape. God, that so that we don't have to live in our sin anymore. But God, we can live with you. God, I pray that if, there's a, if a person in this room that doesn't know you, God, that they would turn their lives over to you. God, that they would live for you. God, and take that story to the next generation. God, I pray that as we come to this song, God, that we will reflect. God, that you would bring to our minds those, those things that you've done in our lives and how you've orchestrated them and weave them into your story. God, and we would share our story with our kids, maybe even over the lunch table today. But God, that we would share our story to each and every person that comes into contact with us so that they will set their hope on you. God, I pray that you will be with us, giving us the courage and the boldness to live this out. God, because as I said at the beginning, it's never too late. God, thank you so much for second chances. In Jesus' name, amen.